Hello YouTube. In this video, I'm going to talk about classification and kinds, uh, particularly with respect to the scientific realism debate. Uh, I do have a rather long video series on scientific realism, which I recommend you check out if you're not familiar with the realism debate. At least check out the introduction. Um, but basically, realists hold that we are justified in taking our best scientific theories to provide true descriptions of the world. Anti-realists deny this. And there are a whole bunch of positions which try to work out a kind of middle path. Um, but, you know, we don't need to go into those details here. Now, an important aspect of realism is its account of classification in science. For a realist, part of the aim of science is to produce natural classification schemes. Uh, that is, schemes that carve nature at its joints. So it seems intuitively obvious that some classification schemes are more natural than others. Uh, some classifications reflect the genuine order and structure of the world, while others are artificial or arbitrary or dependent on our interests, uh, such that they tell us more about us than about the mind-independent world. Uh, so compare, for instance, the periodic table, which classifies the chemical elements, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and so on. Uh, these are paradigm examples of natural kinds, uh, compare this to a classification of items into types of furniture, chairs, tables, stools, cabinets, beds. Uh, when we say that a certain set of entities are chairs, that seems more arbitrary and culturally dependent than when we say that a certain set of entities are samples of mercury. Uh, one way to look at this is, we might suppose that an advanced alien civilization would surely recognise the exact same chemical elements that we do, right? They would group the elements into hydrogen, helium, lithium, and so on, on the basis of atomic number, but they might not have anything like our classification of furniture. And even if they were to learn our classification of furniture, it probably wouldn't be of any particular importance to them. So there are three generally accepted desiderata for a natural classification scheme. Um, this comes from John Dupre's Disorder of Things. First, the classification should exhibit categorical distinctness. Uh, that is to say, it should have sharp distinctions. There should be a determinate fact uh, of the matter into which class a particular item falls. If there is instead only continuous variation, if there's just a spectrum of, of things, then it's up to us where to draw the lines. So in that case, as Brian Ellis in his book Scientific Essentialism puts it, if we have to draw a line anywhere, then it becomes our distinction, not nature's. Uh, we can't be carving nature at its joints if there are no joints at which to carve. Dupre's second criterion is that the natural classification must in some sense be discovered, not merely invented. Of course, we have to decide to construct a classification scheme in the first place, but the distinctions in the scheme must correspond in some sense to distinctions in the world. Uh, the, the kinds in our classification scheme should correspond to the natural kinds. The final desideratum is that assigning an object to a particular kind must allow us to reliably infer as many other properties of the object as possible. The ideal would be that the classification would tell us everything about the object. Um, so like, you know, when we know that something is mercury, this allows us to infer a whole bunch of other properties about it. Uh, so uh, Dupre's three desiderata here usefully summarizes the traditional realist view of natural kinds. Um, uh, so it's uh, yeah th this is this is going to be uh, what is required of a natural classification scheme. So why should we believe that there are natural kinds? How do we go about uh, constructing natural classifications? How do we how do we justify the claim that a given classification scheme is natural? Well, among scientific realists, there's a general consensus in favour of a, a kind of naturalist approach. Uh, the assumption is that you know, if anything provides access to the natural kinds, it's science, right? Uh, if natural classification schemes are to be found anywhere, it's within our best scientific theories. So our philosophical account of natural kinds must accommodate the results of the sciences. Um, and, and this kind of view is supported by the standard realist epistemology. As I have discussed in previous videos on realism, contemporary realists tend to appeal to inference to the best explanation to motivate uh, their ontological commitments. We are justified in taking our best theories to provide true descriptions of the world, or more precisely in this case, we are justified in taking our best theories to provide classification schemes that carve nature at its joints, because that is the best explanation for the 
predictive, explanatory, and manipulative successes of those theories. So here are just a few uh, representative examples of this kind of view. Uh, Richard Boyd, uh, in his paper Homeostasis, Species and Higher Taxa, says, and I quote, it is, a true, it is a truism that the philosophical theory of natural kinds is about how classificatory schemes come to contribute to the epistemic reliability of inductive and explanatory practices. The theory of natural kinds is about how schemes of classification contribute to the formulation and identification of projectable hypotheses, um, inductive hypotheses, basically. Anjan Chakravarti, in his book A Metaphysics for Scientific Realism, says, and I quote, the primary motivation for thinking that there are such things as natural kinds is the idea that carving nature according to its own divisions yields groups of objects that are capable of supporting successful inductive generalizations and predictions. So the story goes, one's recognition of natural categories facilitates these practices and thus furnishes an excellent explanation for their success. Uh, Catherine Kozlicki in Natural Kinds and Natural Kind Terms suggests that those who are realists about natural kinds and I quote, are typically motivated in their belief in the existence of natural kinds by the role these kinds play in one, induction and prediction, two, the laws of nature, and three, causal explanation. So the general assumption underlying these realist approaches is that natural kinds are connected with the inductive and explanatory success of science. Our best scientific theories track the natural kinds and this explains the predictive and explanatory successes of those theories. Um, so, you know, so the best explanation for the success of science, right, is that science carves nature at its joints. Um, and so obviously our philosophical account of natural kinds should then be based on the results of science. Now, of course, this need not involve the assumption that all the kinds found in scientific theories correspond to natural kinds. Uh, it's a familiar point that many theories have been discarded and with their disappearance, many theoretical terms that had once been taken to refer to natural kinds slipped out of use. Nobody supposes that caloric or phlogiston name natural kinds. We also know that current theories are incomplete and are likely to change at least somewhat in the future. Um, so uh, this point is generally dealt with by appealing to approximate truth. The realist will say more precisely, our theories are not true, but approximately true. Similarly, our theories do not exactly track all of the natural kinds, but they approximately track some of the natural kinds. Um, and we may be mistaken about some kinds, we may be ignorant of others, but by and large our theories get it right. Um, and then it's going to be the task of philosophy to provide a theory of natural kinds that makes sense of this and explains how this can be the case. Now, it's important to bear in mind that realists will recognise that our classification schemes are partly driven by our goals and interests. So. So I said that for, for realists, natural kinds are discovered, not invented, and natural classification will carve nature at its joints. Nevertheless, uh, we, we still have to decide which of those joints actually matters to us. So our interests influence our classification schemes insofar as they guide our selection of possible classification schemes. Basically, there are many natural kinds in the world, and so there are many ways of classifying things in the world it would be utterly unwieldy to try to track all of the natural kinds, so we have to decide which ones to latch onto. And this is dependent on our interests insofar as different classifications will be appropriate for different purposes. So, so interests play a role in, in guiding the selection of uh, classification schemes. Um, so I mean, like, a simple example of this would be that you know, for the purposes of analysing an ecosystem or, you know, analysing the uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary trajectories and dynamics of populations in a particular ecosystem, it uh, probably won't be necessary to um, track, you know, the natural kinds of, that, that, we, that we track in chemistry, right? You're probably not going to need to uh, apply the periodic table or the whole periodic table or, or whatever, right? There are going to be, and similarly, you know, you're not going to need to know about the different kinds of galaxies or kinds of stars or whatever. That's going to be irrelevant. And there may be some natural kinds that we just haven't uncovered because uh, it's not necessary for any particular purpose so far. Okay. All of this uh, leaves open the precise details of what the realist takes a natural kind to be. So what it is that makes something a 
joint of nature. The most prominent options are essentialism and homeostatic property cluster theory. I have a video on essentialism about natural kinds, so I won't detail that here. On the homeostatic property cluster view, natural kinds are clusters of properties. So there are certain sets of properties that tend to cluster together in nature in that these properties reliably co-occur across a wide range of conditions where the co-occurrence of these properties is due to, um, well, one of two things, right? Either some of the properties in the cluster tend to favour the occurrence of other properties in the cluster, or the properties in the cluster arise due to some shared underlying causal mechanism. Um, the homeostatic property cluster account was explicitly designed to account for cases in which traditional essentialism seemed implausible, like biological species. Um, so, yeah, but species don't seem to have essences. There doesn't seem to be any you know, necessary and sufficient conditions for species membership. Um, instead, a species can be seen as a more or less tightly connected cluster of properties. That's, that's the idea. As I say, we don't really need to enter into the debates between essentialism, property clusters, other views of kinds here. What is shared by uh, these realist approaches uh, is the claim that number one scientific classification schemes carve nature at its joints so that the classification schemes reveal the natural kinds however exactly natural kinds are to be understood uh, second the grounds for believing in natural kinds the grounds for believing that a you know that a classification scheme tracks the natural kinds is that this classification scheme is provided by a theory that exhibits various predictive and explanatory successes. Okay, so it's the success of science that justifies the belief that our theory uh, is, is true. Um, indeed, part of what it is for a theory to be true is for its classification scheme to track the natural kinds. And then third, interests, our, our like personal human interests, our personal perspective, that influences classification schemes by guiding the selection of the relevant kinds, but that's basically all. It guides the selection of possible classifications. So I'm going to challenge realist views of classification and present an alternative anti-realist approach. In particular, I'll draw from an intriguing though rather underdeveloped discussion of classification from Ron Guieri's book Scientific Perspectivism, in which he introduces the notion of theoretical kinds. Uh, if you want more detail on Guieri's general position here, uh, check out my video Scientific Realism 10 Perspectivism. Uh, I explain his overall views. Anyway, Guieri reframes questions concerning classification in terms of theoretical kinds rather than natural kinds. What are theoretical kinds? Well, to explain this concept, Guieri gives the example of models in classical mechanics. So, <clears throat> In the case of classical mechanics, um, we have various models based on Newton's laws, right? Newton's laws form the general principles of classical mechanics. Now, in themselves, Guieri says, Newton's laws don't actually make any empirical claims. What they do is relate quantities such as force, mass, position, velocity, acceleration, and so on. Um, they don't tell us what specifically counts as a force or a mass in the world. Um, as I say, they, 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 they relate or define these different quantities. These laws are important because they allow us to construct more specific models which do represent the world. And, and we construct these more specific models by adding specific conditions to the laws, to the principles. For example, if we add to Newton's laws the uh, this condition about what the force is, uh, f equals minus kx, where k is a positive constant and x is displacement from an equilibrium position, this yields a model for the simple harmonic oscillator. This model is still highly abstract, uh, but we make it more specific still by adding yet further specifications. For example, we can take x as the displacement of a mass on a rod, that will give us the model of a pendulum, a simple pendulum. Uh, models of other oscillating systems like bouncing springs and vibrating strings can be derived by adding different specifications to the simple harmonic oscillator model. So using Newton's laws, we can generate these nested sets of models. This diagram shows the, the overall situation. Um, so we've got, you know, we, have, we have Newton's laws and then we, we use these laws to derive these fairly abstract general models for uh, uniform motion, orbital motion, harmonic motion. Um, and then from these models, we can get still more specific models by adding further conditions. So we get models for the, from, from 
model of harmonic motion, we get the model of the simple pendulum, the bouncing spring, the vibrating string. And from these, uh, you know, the simple pendulum, say, we can construct a whole bunch of other models, right? There are, there are a variety of pendulum models, for instance, which are more or less idealized. So <clears throat> Guieri says that each of these models is a kind, a kind of mechanical system, to be precise. Um, and more specifically, these models are theoretical kinds. They're not simply found in the world in any straightforward sense. Instead, they are defined using the principles of uh, the classical mechanics theory. Um, indeed, so far, all we have are sets of models, right? I mean, the, the next step is to coordinate some of these models with the world, which involves identifying various elements of the model with specific things in the world. So for the model of the pendulum, I might identify the bob in the abstract model with a real mass on the end of a real string, right? So, you know, you you have the abstract model of a pendulum, right, which is defined mathematically. I mean, I guess you could diagram it out or whatever, but it's, it's a mathematical construction. And then you can take some real system, like in a clock or whatever, and you can identify parts of this abstract model with parts of the real system. Um, and so now, of course, you have a model that represents uh, various systems in the world, such as the actual pendulum in a clock. But now here is the crucial point. All of these models contain idealizations. So our model of a simple pendulum will assume that there is no friction, that there is no air resistance, that the bob is a point mass, that the cord on which the bob swings is massless, and so on. And we can develop more sophisticated models that remove some of these idealizations, but we will never produce a model of a system that describes that system in perfect exact detail. Uh, all of the models that we use are idealized. As a result, no real system ever perfectly matches the behavior of the theoretical model that is applied to it. So in order to identify empirical counterparts to our theoretical models, so in order to say that a given empirical system instantiates the model, we have to specify, okay, in what respects do we need them to match? And to what degree do we need them to match, right? How, how much variation from the ideal model can be tolerated? Um, models are similar to, work, to, to real systems. And so to say whether the real system instantiates the model, we have to specify the respects and degrees of similarity that matter. That's up to us. Um, and it's going to, yeah, it's going to be dependent on our, on our interests. If we are designing a precision experiment involving a mechanical oscillator, we might require its period to be one part in a million of the ideal theoretical oscillator. If we're trying to build a child's toy, one part in fifty um, or even less is is good enough. So there's no objective answer to whether a given empirical system is a harmonic oscillator or is a pendulum. Um, or any other mechanical kind, that it's, it's, it's indeterminate until we have specified the relevant respects and degrees of similarity. So broadly speaking then, a theoretical kind is a kind defined by an idealized model. These models may be more or less similar to systems in the world, but these models also deviate sometimes very radically from the worldly systems. Uh, I mean, the, the, the real system only ever approximates the behavior of the model in certain respects. It may have radically different properties in other respects. Um, so like, you know, as I say, uh, if, if you have a simple pendulum model, right, it assumes that there is no air resistance or that the bob is a point mass or that the cord on which the bob swings is massless. Um, the real system deviates from these assumptions quite radically, right, in, in those respects. So a theoretical kind doesn't correspond in any straightforward sense with things in the world, um, and our classification of theoretical kinds doesn't, again, doesn't in any straightforward sense track natural kinds, uh, even on the most liberal view of what constitutes a natural kind. So recall that for the realist, um, our interests influence classification insofar as interests guide the selection of possible classification schemes, where all of these uh, possible schemes are the schemes that track natural kinds, right? There are many natural kinds in the world, and of course, depending on our interests, we might end up distinguishing different kinds. On the view presented here, selection isn't all that's going on. But rather, we have these theories and models that specify various idealized kinds. In classical mechanics, 
um, harmonic oscillators are a kind. And then there are various kinds of harmonic oscillators, such as the pendulum. But this kind is idealized. It's never actually instantiated in the real world. It's simply similar to various systems in the world. It's similar in certain respects and to certain degrees. And now identifying empirical systems with this idealized model requires us to decide what respects and degrees of similarity matter to us. And that's how it is with scientific classification in general. I mean, Gary uh, presents his view in terms of classical mechanics. And so yeah, the, 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 the specific claims that are made about how classical mechanics works and how that relates to the world um, may not hold for all theories, but this general point that what we get in science are idealized models that are similar to the world, that's uh, going to be true for classification in general, um, at least on uh, Gieri's view. Now, as I said, this view is presented um, in, in his book, Scientific Perspectivism, but his discussion of it is pretty brief. There's literally only a couple of pages on what he calls theoretical kinds. So what I want to do in this video is examine in a bit more detail how, uh, you know, how, how theoretical kinds are uh, coordinated with the things that we find in the world, right? Um, like how it is that we uh, treat a worldly system as exemplifying a theoretical kind. What's the, what's the process there? Okay, one of the primary ways in which theoretical kinds are coordinated with the world is through boundary construction. Uh, broadly speaking, boundary construction involves the drawing of discrete boundaries where there is only continuous variation in the world. Um, it's a way of reducing the world's complexity. Um, and notice that in, in all of these cases, it's impossible to satisfy the first criterion for a uh, natural classification scheme that was noted by uh, Dupre, that of sharp distinctions. So uh, recall the Ellis quote, um, you know, if we have to draw a line anywhere, then it becomes our distinction, not nature's. Uh, so let's go through some important types of boundary construction. A first type of boundary construction is what I'm calling chunking continuous variation. The simplest example of this is provided by geographical boundaries in maps. Consider drawing the boundaries of a wetland where at, at no one point is there a clear distinction between the wetland and the surrounding areas such as the forest. Um, and where the wetland will expand and recede over the year. Um, Sismondo and Chrisman, in their article Deflationary Metaphysics and the Natures of Maps, find that in the official designations of wetland, and I quote, only 8% of the area defined as wetland by one source was defined as wetland by all four. So they looked at four different sources for uh, defining wetland and uh, only 8% of areas defined by one was defined as wetland by all. Um, now, there can be no precise point at which a wetland becomes a forest for three reasons. First, because the environment is constantly changing throughout the seasons, um, but we may obviously need a uh, representation of the environment that, of, that holds for a larger period of time than just the present moment, right? Um, you know, if you don't want to have to just constantly be changing a map every single day, sometimes we need a more stable representation. But if the environment is constantly in flux, uh, that means that uh, we're going to have to just draw a, an arbitrary line. Uh, second, even at a single time, the relevant boundary properties are dependent on our interests. So in distinguishing between wetland and forest, we might focus on the gradient in plant species, or we might focus on the gradient uh, of the light hitting the ground, or we might take some other gradient. We might take some other properties. Different gradients will be relevant to different research purposes. And while um, these gradients will, of course, overlap, they're not likely to be exactly congruent. Um, so depending on which boundary properties we focus on, we're going to be drawing the line differently. Finally, perhaps most importantly, even if we were to specify a single one of these properties at a single time, if we look closely, we're going to find a gradient, not a sharp boundary. Um, now, at the scale of a map, say, that might not make any difference, but uh, for various reasons, we might want to look at the area more closely. And when we do that, we're going to see that any, any line between wetland and forest is partly arbitrary. Uh, similarly, um, 
uh, Cadenesso and uh, co-authors in the article A Framework for a Theory of Ecological Boundaries. They cite research showing that when demarcating forests, the forest environmental conditions often extend well beyond the defined forest, and different boundaries will be drawn depending on which properties are relevant to the given research project. They summarise, uh, I quote, Difficulties in discerning edge effects arise from the fact that each one of several environmental factors may change within a unique edge zone. What may be considered an edge depends on the factors studied, the site specificity of analytic models, and the experimental design. So in general, when, when demarcating ecological boundaries, um, there, there's often an element of arbitrariness. We just have to decide where to draw the lines. And actually, ecologists will often appeal to features that are completely arbitrary in terms of ecological factors. They might use items of cultural significance, like fences, uh, say, in order to draw their lines. Uh, astronomers face this situation in attempting to distinguish stellar kinds, because the properties that form the basis of stellar classification, such as temperature, luminosity, mass, strength of hydrogen absorption lines, and so on, are continuous. Um, the standard stellar classification system is the morgan keenan system, which distinguishes seven standard spectral classes. There's O, B, A, F, G, K, M, uh, which classifies stars from hottest to coolest. Each of these is subdivided further into spectral types, uh, using digits from 0 to 9, again from hottest to coolest. Stellar classification is dependent on our interests, on exactly how fine-grained we want our classifications to be, and it also exhibits what Stephanie Rufi in her article Stellar Kinds calls resolution dependency. The classification is dependent on the resolution of our instruments, because what looks homogeneous at a relatively low resolution will be inhomogeneous at a higher resolution. Notice that in principle, we could continue to subdivide stellar kinds indefinitely until eventually each class contains just a single star. Um, obviously this system would be uh, hopelessly unwieldy, uh, it wouldn't really be very useful. Chunking is unavoidable in cases like this. We place stars together in a single class when they have certain features which are similar enough to some standard ideal star, so we can specify the the kind of ideal O-type star, the ideal B-type star, and then we group stars together on the basis of how similar they are to that ideal, or how similar they are to that exemplar. Uh, similarly, there are contexts where astronomers classify stars by mass. Now, the masses of many stars are unknown with any precision. Uh, mass is, is very difficult to determine. Nevertheless, we do know that mass must, like all these other properties, exhibit continuous variation. Dividing entities by mass is a classic example of an arbitrary classification scheme. Uh, in the book The Disorder of Things, uh, John Dupre gives the example of a classification of things into uh, those with uh, those that weigh less than one kilogram, those uh, between one kilogram to two kilograms, those between two kilograms to three kilograms, and so on. Um, that kind of scheme, according to him, is one that is uh, thoroughly artificial, at least intuitively. It's intuitively just purely artificial and arbitrary. But actually, <laughs> Uh, stars are uh, grouped on the basis of mass. So uh, if you think of certain models of the internal structure of stars, this comes from the textbook Universe by Roger Friedman and William Kaufman. Well, the internal structure of a star depends on its mass. When the mass is below about 0.4 solar masses, energy flow is fully convective throughout the body of the star. For stars between 0.4 and 4 solar masses, the star will have an inner radiative zone and an outer convective zone. And for stars above four solar masses, there will be an inner convective zone and an outer radiative zone. These differences arise from the fact that the more massive the star is, the greater the temperature difference between the inner layer and the outer layer. Now, as I say, there's continuous variation in mass. Stars do not come neatly packaged into three types of masses. Um, and notice, of course, that this cross cuts the previous stellar classification system. This cross-cuts the uh, morgan keenan system. So we find continuous variation even in apparently direct perception. Uh, David Danks, in his article Safe and Substantive Perspectivism, cites psychological research on categorical perception, 
So in perception, we impose strict categories and we lose the ability to detect intermediate forms. In, in English, the R and L sounds, uh, English speakers cannot distinguish intermediate phonemes. So the intermediates are going to be heard as being either R or L. And generally, we just, we just don't detect things that are intermediate between those sounds. So even perception itself is going to simplify, idealize, it's going to distort information. It, it presents a distorted picture of acoustic properties where continuous variation will be experienced as discrete chunks. Even where the phenomena exhibit continuous variation, idealized models will be sharply distinct. Um, you know, we take the case of the models of internal stellar structure. Well, we can't neatly divide stars by mass. Uh, there, there is going to be smooth variation here. And uh, astronomers will generate more specific models to account for this, but there will always be uh, fairly abstract models, highly idealized, that exhibit sharp distinctions. When we coordinate these models with the world, when we take things in the world as instantiating these models, then we treat the world as if it contained discrete categories when it does not. A second type of boundary construction is what we might call causal constitution specification. When we describe things in the world, we must distinguish between processes that are partly constitutive of a larger process and processes that are merely causal influences on that larger process. Uh, for example, do the gut microbiota count as part of the human organism? Do they count as part of what is sometimes called the holobiont? Or are they separate organisms that interact closely with the human organism? So this is a question of where we draw the, the boundaries of the biological individual. What counts as a single biological organism, a single biological individual? I do have a couple of videos on biological individuality if you want to get into this debate more seriously, but just to give a flavour of the debate, one standard way we might try to draw this distinction is by appealing to genomes. Two cells count as part of the same organism if they contain the same DNA, if they have the same genotype. So the E. coli cells in the human gut are separate organisms because they have a completely different genome from human cells. An entity counts as a single organism just in case all of its cells are genetically homogenous. But there are some pretty serious problems with genetic homogeny as a criterion here. So first of all, monozygotic twins. By the genetic criterion, it looks like they would count as two scattered parts of the same biological organism because they have the same genes. Second, there is chimerism. In chimerism, an organism develops from the fusion of two embryos, causing it to be a mixture of cells with different genomes. Third, um, there is the ubiquitous phenomenon whereby the uh, genomes in the cell of an organism will, in the cells of an organism, will diverge over time just due to mutation. So as your cells divide, there are errors during uh, DNA replication. And, and this is ubiquitous. This is just happening all the time. So in fact, there is never perfect genetic homogeneity. Finally, consider cases like mitochondria. It turns out mitochondria have a different genome to the larger cell. Uh, so there's a small circular chromosome of mitochondrial DNA contained in the mitochondria. Um, and it is now believed that the modern eukaryotic cell actually arose through endosymbiosis. So the, uh, the, 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 the ancestor of the mitochondrion was engulfed by some, um, some earlier cell, and, and then that became the modern eukaryotic cell. So the, the nuclear DNA and the mitochondrial DNA have separate origins, um, because the mitochondria was descended from some sort of prokaryote that was engulfed by a larger cell. So if you look at the mitochondria inside the larger cell, you have separate origins and separate DNA. We don't generally class the mitochondrion as a separate organism, though. Now, obviously, genetic homogeneity isn't the only way of specifying a biological organism, but all other criteria for biological individuality face similar problems. And one natural answer to these problems is to say, well, there is no objective line. There is no objective division in nature. Where we draw the line is dependent on our interests. Maybe from the point of view of an analysis of the broader ecosystem, we would treat the gut flora as just being parts of a given individual organism, whereas from the point of view of the developmental history of an organism, it might make more sense to treat them as being separate, as being causal influences rather than as parts. 
Uh, another example of this uh, kind of debate, uh, uh, debates concerning causal constitution and determinacy, is found in the literature on the extended mind. According to the extended mind thesis, cognitive processes are partly constituted by processes beyond the brain. Uh, a famous example from Andy Clark and David Chalmers is the case of Otto and Inga. Both Inga and Otto wants to visit the Museum of Modern Art. Inga is a normal human, so she thinks for a second, she remembers that the museum is on 53rd Street, and she sets off to 53rd Street. We would, of course, have no problem saying that Inga believes the museum is on 53rd Street, and she believed this before she consciously remembered it. Uh, beliefs are dispositional, so she had this belief stored in her memory, and then she recalled it. Now, Otto has Alzheimer's, in order to help deal with this, he carries a notebook with him wherever he goes, in which he notes important information, such as locations. So when he wants to visit the museum, he checks his notebooks, sees the museum is located on 53rd Street, and he sets off. Now what Clark and Chalmers suggest is that there isn't really any relevant difference between the structures in Inga's brain on the one hand, and Otto's notebook on the other. Otto's notebook literally forms part of his memory. It, it literally forms part of his beliefs about the world. Otto plus notebook can be modelled as a single cognitive system. Um, I won't go into this debate in detail. Obviously, this is a controversial thesis. Uh, you, can, you can look up the extended mind if you want to know more. The point is, traditionally, we think that cognition occurs in the brain, and then the rest of the environment is a causal influence on the brain's cognitive processes. But according to the extended mind, the environment is sometimes partly constitutive of cognition. So this is a good example of how that line between causal influence and constitution can shift. And notice that the issue here is not that we can't clearly distinguish between, you know, where the brain ends and the rest of the world begins. Now, of course, if the scale is small enough, actually that does become fuzzy. But the point is that in the context of the extended mind debate, that's not treated as a problem. Rather, the question is, which processes count as constitutive of cognition and which are merely causal influences on cognition? Um, so, I mean, one way to put this point is that even once we have distinguished spatial boundaries or boundaries between different entities, we still face the question of how those entities are grouped into larger systems. So, you know, we, we might imagine, okay, let's say we can distinguish between the brain, body and external environment, um, and these distinctions are, are sharp, right? So, brain, body and various environmental entities are straightforwardly natural kinds. Let's imagine that world, right? But, but now we we notice that brains are involved in various cognitive processes. And when we can ask, what is it that, that grounds cognitive processes? Is it just the brain, or are various things beyond the brain partly constitutive of cognition? That's the extended mind debate. And you can see that's slightly different from uh, chunking continuous variation. But uh, there's still a kind of boundary construction here insofar as we decide uh, where that line between causation and constitution lies. Okay, a third type of boundary construction is scale construction. And this occurs when discrete boundaries arise as a result of restrictions in the domain of analysis. There are fairly obvious ways to do this in an ad hoc manner. Uh, for example, suppose I decide to focus only on the O-type and M-type stars. Well, in that case, although there will be continuous variation within each class, there will also be an obvious discontinuity. So all stars will fall very clearly into two different types, two radically different types with no indeterminacy. Now, that particular way of restricting the domain of analysis is unlikely to tell us anything particularly interesting, but there are less artificial ways in which discrete boundaries emerge through our choices, um, it, it, through us constructing a particular scale for analyzing a given system. Um, so in one way to, to start thinking about this is to note that there are a number of uh, boundary properties that are scale dependent in that they change with grain size. Length is the most famous example of this, so consider the famous coastline paradox. The uh, length of a coastline is dependent on the unit of measurement, with larger units of measurement generating apparently shorter coastlines as uh, bends and so on that are smaller than the units of measurement are um, 
smoothed out. So if you measure with units of about 50 kilometers, the coastline of Britain is approximately 3,400 kilometers. If you measure with units of 100 kilometers, the coastline of Britain is about 2,800 kilometers. Um, so so you, you, you can see that as the unit of measurement gets larger, you smooth out the bends, and so you get a shorter apparent coastline. So the length of a coastline can't be defined independently of a particular measurement system, and the appropriate measurement system will depend on exactly how much resolution we require. That's a pragmatic matter, but there is no true unit of measurement, right? There's no, there's no like real unit of measurement. I mean, it's, it's up to us to decide. Um, I, I, now, I mean, one obvious response to this is to say, ah, well, there is a true unit of measurement and that's just the smallest possible length, the Planck length. Uh, but the problem is that once you get to that level, we'll no longer be able to specify exactly what counts as part of the coastline. So uh, in order to, so we, yeah, we'd have to say, for instance, that like this atom is part of the coastline and this atom right next to it is not. Well, obviously that would be fairly silly. A coastline, like all geographical boundaries, does not have a precise edge. So even in the ideal circumstances, as it were, uh, where there's like an omniscient being that can perceive all the facts and that, you know, even down to the, the smallest possible unit of measurement. Um, well, in that case, there isn't really such a thing as, as a coastline. The coastline itself um, is going to be an example of the first type of boundary construction, chunking continuous variation. Um, and then once you look at the coastline at a, a higher scale so that a, a clear coastline emerges, um, its length is going to be dependent on units of measurement. Now, in a similar way, discrete boundaries can be dependent on scale. So consider species. There has long been a debate among biologists and philosophers of biology concerning how to define species, and there are a variety of different species concepts that have been proposed. Uh, so two species concepts that are used in biology. Um, there's the biological species concept, according to which a species is any population of organisms that can interbreed and that are reproductively isolated from other populations. So two, met, two organisms are members of the same species just in case they can breed with each other and produce fertile offspring. Then there are various phylogenetic species concepts. Uh, they all emphasize historical patterns of ancestry and descent. So all members of a species must be descended from the same branch on the tree of life. Um, and there are a whole bunch of others. I mean, there's loads of species concepts. Now, despite decades of debate, there's no consensus on the correct species concept. Uh, part of the problem is that the history of life is one of continuous variation, you know, all organisms evolve from a common ancestor. Uh, um, and, and second, there are a number of different evolutionary factors that can produce a cohesive lineage. Um, and there the are often just as good reasons to classify based on one factor rather than another. Um, so th th this point is quite familiar. Uh, I actually have a couple of videos examining uh, the species problem, which you might want to check out. What I want to emphasize here is how our ability to apply a particular species concept may depend on the scale of analysis. So take the biological species concept. Well, um, yeah, this is the idea that two organisms are members of the same species, just in case they can interbreed. This concept is clearly useful, and it, it certainly reveals you know, genuine discontinuities between populations. So reproductive isolation is a significant evolutionary process. Um, it, it plays an important evolutionary role. When you have, you know, if you, if you have a population, right, which you know, splits into two populations, and then over time, those two populations become unable to interbreed, that's a significant barrier, and they now become different lineages. They evolve separately, or at least they're very likely to start evolving separately. So this is a significant thing. The biological species concept is important. Um, but now consider the phenomenon of ring species. In a ring species, you have several populations forming a geographic ring. So here we have yeah, one to seven, right? So there's seven different populations. This is actually um, species of gulls around the Arctic Circle. Um, so we have this geographic ring, um, and one and seven occupy adjacent areas. Now, members of one can interbreed with members of two, members of two can interbreed with members of three, and so on, but the members of one cannot interbreed with members of seven. Um, in, it's, in the case of the gulls, 
uh, this is well this is this is exactly what happens right you have this you have interbreeding populations forming a ring around the arctic circle which terminate in um, Laris fuscus and Laris argentatus which I'm probably pronouncing incorrectly but whatever they occupy adjacent areas in Europe but they cannot interbreed um, so yeah how do we apply the biological species criterion here uh, it, it looks like if you if you start from one and go to two and then three and then four and then five and six and seven if you do it like if you do it that way then it all counts as one species because they're all interbreeding but then if you just look at one and seven they're two separate species so you know, what's going on now in a study that focuses only on Europe say the biological species criterion can be quite straightforwardly applied in this case there are clearly defined reproductively isolated groups of goals right so you have um, Laris fuscus and Laris argentatus they can't interbreed they're, they're, they're goals they're in, they, they live in the same sort of area um, but they're separate uh, evolving separately because they can't interbreed but if you zoom out to a larger area this no longer looks like an appropriate criterion for demarcating species of goals it's, it's just not going to help because they form this interbreeding ring around the Arctic. Similarly, notice that it would form, sorry, notice that it would make very little sense to apply the biological species criterion across different time periods. I am a member of the same species as humans from 100 years ago, but obviously I couldn't interbreed with humans from 100 years ago. Um, it, it looks like we'd have to introduce counterfactuals here so we'd have to say something like well if Cain Baker lived at the same time as this person from a hundred years ago then they would be able to interbreed but then how do we rule out other counterfactuals counterfactuals which would lead us to judge you know humans and chimpanzees to be the same species so with respect to technology it would probably be easier to manipulate things so as to get humans and chimpanzees to interbreed than it would be uh, to get modern humans and humans from a hundred years ago to interbreed. I mean, maybe you know, time travel is just conceptually impossible, right? It doesn't seem to be conceptually impossible for humans and chimpanzees to be interbreed, to, to interbreed with technological intervention, but time travel might be just conceptually impossible. Um, so, you know, the, the point is, if, if we are classifying in terms of the biological species criterion, we are already limiting um, the the scope of the classification to a particular time period. So in all of these ways and more, biologists can construct discrete boundaries between species and the, the conditions for appropriate applications of particular theoretical species concepts. They construct those conditions by altering the scale of analysis, by altering the level of zoom, by altering the grain size. Um, you know, in, in general then, if we take a specific ecosystem at a specific time, there's probably going to be clear objective divisions between the species with very few intermediary forms. But if we zoom out and start looking at a larger area or we start considering more of the history of life, the objective divisions disappear and we find this messy, gradual variation. We're going to be forced to adopt different classification criteria. Now, it is worth noting that there is some controversy about the extent to which um, scale construction is really constructive. Uh, so scale relativity is viewed in a slightly different way by Ladyman and Ross, for example, in their book, Everything Must Go. According to Ladyman and Ross, scale relativity is, a, is an ontological feature of the world. They say that what exists is relative to the scale at which nature is measured. Um, I mean, so they, they literally say, and I quote, at the quantum scale, there are no cats. At scales appropriate for astrophysics, there are no mountains, and there are no cross elasticities of demand in a two person economy. Um, what exists on a given spatiotemporal scale may not exist on some other spatiotemporal scales. Now, from this point of view, the contribution of our practices to our classification schemes is limited to what I earlier called selection, right? We choose the scale that we want to focus on, um, but scales and the properties that obtain at various scales are objective features of the world. 
Now, if this is right, then scale isn't really an example of boundary construction. It's, it's no different from the idea that there are many kinds in the world, but we can select which ones we focus on. So the question here is whether it's at all plausible to treat scales as objective features of the world. Um, you know, is, it, is it true that at the, uh, at the astrophysical scale there are no mountains, that mountains you know, stop existing once we zoom out far enough, or that cats stop existing when we zoom in? Um, I, I mean, frankly, I, I find it hard to even make sense of this. I, I can't really comprehend how that, how that could even work. Um, it's also hard to square with contemporary science because scientific models do not themselves make any distinction in principle between scales, at least not in this kind of way. Um, so biologists will sometimes appeal to quantum effects to explain biological phenomena. Their models will describe causal interactions between you know, the quantum and the biological. Uh, see, for example, the vibration theory of olfaction, or consider experiments showing that in uh, certain carefully controlled conditions, humans are capable of detecting a single photon. Uh, Tinsley and co-authors their article, Direct Detection of a Single Photon by Humans. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not that photons do not exist at the scale of human people, uh, it's rather that we're not usually equipped to, det to detect them, um, and in the vast majority of contexts we simply don't need to. Um, you know, similarly, it's, it's fairly obvious that the behaviour of a cat will affect quantum phenomena, that astrophysical events may be affected by mountains and so on. Um, so it, it seems to me that scales are not somehow objectively there in the world. Scale is rather um, a matter of our measurement capacities, our computational abilities, and what's relevant to us in particular contexts of inquiry. Scales do not exist independently, they are constructed by us, and when we change the scales, in the sense that we consider you know, features of the world with different properties, we detect different patterns, um, or, or different patterns emerge. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think that to suppose that scales are objective independent features of the world would be to conflate natural and theoretical kinds. Okay, so those were some of the processes of boundary construction, and, and that is uh, an important way in which we uh, coordinate idealized models with the, with the messy and complex world. Um, and so, you know, we don't simply uh, sort of, you know, it's, it's not that kinds just exist in the world and that there are these objective divisions in the world. There is a, a much more significant constructive process. Okay, at this point I'd like to note a couple of objections. So, first of all, there seem to be certain clear cases of natural kinds. Uh, where there's not really any boundary construction on our part. The chemical elements are the classic examples. Uh, there is a genuine division between gold and mercury. We can sort substances on the basis of the number of protons in the atomic nucleus, and this tracks a real discontinuity in the world. The chemical elements exhibit all three features that we required of a natural classification scheme. So, first, uh, chemical elements are categorically distinct. Gold does not gradually shade into mercury. Gold has 79 protons, mercury has 80, and there is nothing in between these. By adding one proton to the nucleus of an atom, you fundamentally alter its properties. Second, chemical elements are discovered, not invented. We can specify the necessary and sufficient conditions for something being a particular element. Uh, having an atomic number of 79 is necessary and sufficient for something to be gold. And third, of course, the classification of elements allows us to infer many properties of a substance. If we know that a substance is gold or is mercury, we can infer many of its other features. So with this example in mind, um, it might look like the prospects for a general anti-realism about kinds are, are rather dim. I mean, this seems to be a fairly clear case of where we have a classification scheme which just straightforwardly um, you know, maps on to natural kinds in the world. Um, and that is certainly, I think, uh, yeah, a pretty, pretty plausible case. The chemical elements, as I say, are, are basically the best case scenario for a realist uh, approach to classification. But I do just want to say a couple of things about this, um, that, that maybe on further consideration, uh, the realist approach maybe misses some of the complexities here. So, or at least 
there's still a role for theoretical kinds here. So first of all, um, Julia Burston in her article, uh, Smaller Than a Bread Box, takes the example of, of gold, right? And suppose that you have a collection of several billion atoms of gold, well, not billion, you know, billion, billion, billion atoms of gold, <laughs> lots of atoms of gold. Um, now, if these are grouped together in one massive lump, you'll have a standard piece of gold. It will be a piece of yellow, shiny metal, which can be mel melted down, worked into different shapes, resistant to corrosion and rusting, and so on. But now suppose I break this down into uh, clusters of a few hundred atoms each. These clusters must be suspended in a special solution so they don't coagulate back into a single lump. Now the physical properties of each cluster, such as their ductility and their conductivity, will differ significantly from the physical properties of the lump. Or third, suppose you have a collection of individual non-interacting atoms in a vacuum, so they have uh, no macroscopic properties at all. Um, yeah, because they're just individual atoms, so there won't be any macroscopic properties, uh, at least not of the gold specifically. Um, so one factor to consider here is that even if you take a pure sample of gold, we don't actually individuate kinds of elements simply in terms of their atomic properties. Um, like, not even just in chemistry, right? Even if you're just doing chemistry, chemists will analyze structure and reactivity at various scales. Uh, they, so they will talk about atomic properties, molecular properties, molar properties. When we take a lump of billions of gold atoms or a collection of clusters of hundreds of gold atoms or a collection of individual gold atoms, we will find different properties associated with each. These are different kinds. So the, the microstructure, the structure of the atom, underdetermines the macroscopic properties. Um, I talk about this kind of point a lot more in the video Water is not H2O, um, which... Uh, so you might want to check that out for a bit more detail on this kind of thing. A second point is that, so it's important to bear in mind that when we when we speak of samples of gold or indeed any other element or, or molecule, we are engaging in idealization insofar as we never have a pure sample, at least a perfectly pure sample of any given element. Um, you know, nor can the properties of the sample be precisely specified. So suppose um, we take the first case that I just described. So we have a lump of gold, the, 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 the shiny yellow solid, and we want to determine its properties, right? What is the melting point of gold? Well, it's uh, 1064 degrees centigrade. Ah, but any given lump of gold is going to have some impurities. There will be other elements mixed in with it. So we have to specify standards for what counts as a pure lump of gold. Furthermore, properties such as the melting point will differ in all kinds of conditions. There is no one thing we can specify as the melting point of gold. The melting point of uh, any substance will differ depending on the impurities in the substance and on the, the other environmental conditions beside the temperature like pressure and electrostatic start charge. Now let's say we were to fix all of this precisely. Suppose we were to say the melting point of gold is X, assuming that there are no impurities and assuming a fixed pressure, fixed electrostatic charge, etc., assuming a particular type of experimental apparatus and so on. Now, the trouble is that this tells us relatively little about anything in the actual world because gold, defined in, in this specific sense, hardly ever, if at all, exists. Um, so that is, if, you know, if we take the, the term if we take the phrase the melting point of gold to mean something like the melting point of gold when conditions A, B, C, D, etc. obtain, then hardly anything ever instantiates the melting point of gold because those conditions hardly ever obtain. You know, it would require very precise, uh, some, some very precise conditions in a laboratory to, to make those conditions obtain. So the point is, you know, to have an invariant melting point of gold, you'd need to have a perfectly pure sample of gold and precisely fixed environmental conditions, and of course that never happens in the real world. So that in itself is an idealization. Okay, what's, what's the point of all of this? Well, 
it looks like our classification of elements embodied in the periodic, ta periodic table is perhaps the best case for a realist account of kinds. But, but this only works if we assume a particular perspective on the constituents of the world. Um, that is, you know, if we decide to treat atoms as single individuals. So what, what allows the elements to exhibit the three desiderata of a realist classification scheme right, is precisely that we have uh, taken this perspective on the world. The kinds of the periodic table come into focus only by constructing a particular scale of analysis, and that's going to be motivated by particular interests and goals. The minute we ask, okay, how do these chemical elements coordinate with the kinds that we distinguish in other contexts, such as in everyday experience or in engineering or in various other types of scientific experiments? The moment you consider the various types of interactions between elements, you're going to find that this uh, classification scheme is is uh, in itself insufficient, or at least the idealization has to enter the picture. Um, so, you know, I mean, recall the point that if you zoom into a specific ecosystem at a specific time, you can find clear discontinuities between species. A somewhat similar point holds here. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's somewhat similar. If you zoom in, you know, as it were, to individual atoms, into the building blocks of the world, you can find these clear discontinuities that may be obscured at other scales of analysis. You know, so you take the appropriate scale of analysis, you find this neatly ordered system with clear kinds. Um, but then when you try to coordinate that system with other theories and models we have of the world, we have to start idealizing. Uh, in any case, even uh, if we assume that the realist approach to classification is correct in the case of the elements, that doesn't obviate the need for theoretical kinds in other contexts. Remember the basic realist claim. The success of a theory is what justifies belief that the classification of that theory carves nature at its joints. But the fact is there are plenty of successful theories that cannot, in any reasonable sense, be taken to carve nature's joints. Um, even if the building blocks of the world, the chemical elements, are straightforward natural kinds in the traditional sense, we still have to account for the kinds that are used in other scientific practices. Okay, so that's, 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 that's one concern about this kind of view. A second concern is, uh, well, the view presented here, does this uh, involve a commitment to a problematic kind of social constructionism? Um, so. I mean, hopefully it will not have escaped your notice that theoretical kinds are constructed not just for unobservables, but also for what we directly observe. Now, if kinds are constructed by us, and if we make the plausible assumption that the world just is a collection of various kinds of things, then in what sense do we have access to an objective world at all? Does it make sense on this view to talk of a you know, mind independent or theory independent world? Um, or, or, or do we simply construct the world, construct reality? Um, well, in, in a way, yes, uh, but hopefully not in a way that is too radical. Uh, now, I don't really have time in this video to get in, into the debates concerning realism versus social constructionism, but hopefully it's sufficient to say this. Although kinds are, in a sense, socially constructed, they exhibit an important feature um, that Robert Hudson, in his article, Reliability, Pragmatic and Epistemic, calls volitional impenetrability. So consider these sentences. Um, the sun is a G-type main sequence star, and uh, G-type stars live approximately 10 billion years on the main sequence. Are these statements true? Well, yes, obviously, um, and they're true because of the way the world is. So having adopted a classification scheme, it is then largely out of our hands where the chips will fall, right? Um, like, given that we have the Morgan Keenan classification scheme, the sun just is a G-type main sequence star, right? And that, that's because of the way the world is. Now, now of course, it's, cons I guess, possible, right, to take the sun to be an O-type star, but that would require radical theoretical changes. Um, and, I mean, this is really just a point about, like, underdetermination. So, in principle, you can defend any conclusion you want if you're willing to alter enough of your other beliefs. So yes, you can in principle hold that the sun is an O-type star, but in order to maintain a consistent and predictively powerful theory, 
<laughs> there would be massive ramifications through your other beliefs. So the point that the very concepts G type star and O type star would change radically. The key point is this, you can't simply decide to classify the sun as something other than a G type star. I mean, well, you can, right, but you'll be wrong. Um, we can't just decide that the sun is an O type star. I mean, even if, if everybody, even if everybody said the sun is an O type star, we would all be wrong. The sun is a G type star. Um, again, unless we're prepared to make some really radical and in fact, at this, po at this point, incomprehensible changes to the rest of our theory. So there, there are two factors which hopefully will uh, mitigate concerns about social constructionism. First of all, once we have a classification scheme and once we have identified a particular population of entities, we often have relatively little choice about which class those entities go into. So given that we distinguish stars, right, we have this population of stars, and given that we have the Morgan Keenan classification system for stars, there's just no question that the sun is a G-type star. Um, of course, there are boundary cases that are vague, um, but you know, in, in those cases, we have to appeal to boundary construction more explicitly, but there are plenty of just clear cases as well. Second, many classification schemes will fail to suit whatever our purposes are. So, you know, we can't just choose whatever classification we like. Regarding species, for instance, imagine trying to apply the biological species criterion to the ring species of Arctic gulls. Right, like even if we find a way to shoehorn the populations into that system, there are alternatives that are simpler, more fruitful, that better capture the actual evolutionary relationships. Um, and then obviously, um, since the biological species criterion distinguishes species by reproductive isolation, it's completely useless for asexual organisms. So, you know, in this kind of case, the classification system we adopt isn't entirely up to us. Um, Ian Hacking, in his book, the social construction of what, puts the central claim of social constructionism as follows. He says that X is a social construct when uh, X is not determined by the nature of things, it is not inevitable. So let's take the stellar classification system as a whole. Well, if you look at the stellar classification system as a whole, Hacking's slogan is true for it, right? It's not determined by the nature of things, it's not inevitable. We need not uh, have drawn the lines where we did. We need not have focused on the properties that we did when we were drawing those lines. Um, I mean, even for the properties that we were, you know, so there are certain properties that we were pushed to consider. Um, so we can determine the intrinsic luminosity of a star much more easily and more reliably than we can determine its mass. So it's unsurprising that luminosity is more important in our stellar taxonomies. Well, even that is a product of our place in the world and our particular abilities. It's conceptually possible that there could be beings who could more reliably determine mass rather than luminosity and their classification schemes would likely be different. Um, but yeah, so, so the point is stellar kinds are not inevitable in this respect, right? We, we need not have developed the uh, classifications that we did. On the other hand, given a particular classification system and given a particular research context, there's often very little doubt about how the world is to be pictured. So given stellar theory as it exists today, the sun is inevitably a G-type star. Um, I mean, at least inevitably in terms of what we can do, right? Obviously the history of the universe could have been different, um, uh, but you know, g given that the sun is as it is, it is just inevitably a G-type star. None of the points that I have discussed earlier concerning boundary construction, idealization, all of that stuff, none of that changes any of this. This is volitional impenetrability. And notice that volitional impenetrability does not hold for genuinely social objects such as money. So in the case of money, well, we can simply decide that a particular type of coin is no longer worth one pounds. That's worth, that, that, that's, that's literally what happens when the currency is changed, right? Maybe a particular coin is too easy to counterfeit. And so it's then change, they bring out some new coin. Um, the old one pound coins would, would now be worthless, they're just lumps of metal. This can't be done for stars, at least not without displacing the classification scheme. And second, what, you know, what one pound is changes, the, the value changes through 
processes like inflation in unpredictable ways, ways dependent on how people act. Again, that's not the case for stars. It's the, the, the sun's journey through the constructed categories from you know, G-type to red giant to white dwarf, that's, that's independent of us. Um, so that's, that's an anti-realist view of classification and kinds. Um, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, thanks for watching.